Gonzalez, non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to this episode of Trade Wins, our new bi-weekly virtual event series, where we discuss the future of uh, global trade in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic with leading policymakers and experts from across the world. The Peterson Institute uh, recently launched another uh, virtual event series uh, called Financial Statements and hosted by my colleague, Nicolas Veron. Every other week, uh, Nicolas examines with his guests uh, all the changes happening in the financial world. So I would like to invite you to uh, check it out. Uh, in this, our fourth episode of uh, Trade Wins, we will explore uh, what role for the United Kingdom in the global trading system as it leaves the European Union and builds a new place for itself uh, in the world of trade. And this is important. Uh, not only is the UK one of the uh, top five economies in the world, um, but also at 63.5%, its share of trade in GDP is one of the largest among the big players. So trade matters for the UK and the UK matters for world trade. So to lead our conversation today, I am very honored to have with us two great uh, speakers. Uh, let me first uh, introduce uh, uh, Elizabeth Liz Truss, uh, who is a member of uh, parliament and currently secretary of state for international trade and president uh, for the board of trade uh, of the UK. She's also Minister for Women and the Equalities. At a crucial time for Brexit, Secretary Truss has been charged with securing new trade deals and partnerships uh, across the world. Not a minor challenge uh, for sure. Liz is joined by Adam Posen, who is uh, first and foremost uh, the president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics, but he's also an expert on the UK economy and on trade among others. So actually, Adam was made an honorary commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II in 2014 for his services to British economic policy. So for full disclosure, Adam is also my boss at Peterson and a great supporter of Tradewinds. So welcome uh, to both of you, and thank you very much for being here with us at uh, Tradewinds. So I will turn it over uh, to Liz and Adam uh, in a moment, uh, but for you in the audience, uh, thank you very much for being uh, with us. And please get ready to submit your questions using the Q&A feature uh, in the platform. So let me uh, maybe say a few words uh, before, before uh, we start uh, with our speakers. Um, and uh, as it left the European Union on January 31st this year, the UK is currently crafting a new trade policy and defining its place in the global trading system. And this includes, among others, positioning itself on several fronts, such as the World Trade Organization, the negotiation of priority trade agreements, the reproduction of existing EU trade agreements, and the extension of preferential trade regimes for poor countries. So the UK was a founding uh, party to the GATT in 1947, and is an original member of the WTO in its own right. And it has been taking all the necessary technical steps uh, to get ready to manage its WTO presence. We have also begun to hear its voice uh, on such important topics uh, as trade and development, technical barriers to trade, uh, support for current negotiations on e-commerce, uh, WTO reform to, attack, uh, to uh, tackle unfair practices, and most recently, the role of the WTO in supporting a clean, inclusive, and resilient recovery in the wake of the pandemic. So one of the most important consequences of the UK leaving the EU uh, is that it is able to negotiate, sign, uh, and ratify new trade agreements. And this could come into force uh, by December or after December 31st this year. Now, given the wide network of agreements that the EU had in place, this means that the negotiation of these uh, deals is more of a necessity uh, rather than an option to provide UK firms with preferential framework uh, to access foreign markets and for the UK to help keep its relations in place. 
So while this is a very exciting program, certainly for someone who's a, a trade negotiator at heart, like I am, it is also the case that these are very challenging times and conditions for making progress on trade cooperation and that there is a lot of uncertainty associated to it. So uh, let me now see if we have Secretary Truss online. Uh, are you with us, uh, uh, Liz? I am, thank you very much, hello. Oh, all right, thank you, thank you very much and, uh, and welcome. Uh, we know that the UK is currently negotiating trade agreements uh, with the EU, with the US, uh, with Japan, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, you have also expressed the UK's interest in joining the comprehensive uh, and progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTPP, and you've also expressed that you want to become an active player in the WTO. So can I please ask you to share with us uh, the UK's vision and strategic priorities on the trade negotiation front, uh, and also what would you expect to achieve a year from now? So over to you, Secretary Truss. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, as you right, rightly point out, the UK has a unique opportunity. After 40 years of membership of the European Union, we are now able to uh, strike out with our own independent trade policy. But also we have a necessity, uh, as all countries do, in terms of recovering from the COVID crisis, of making new economic links and also reducing the barriers for our firms to trade with the rest of the world. So our ambition over the medium term is for the UK to become the centre of a network of free trade agreements to give our businesses access to lower tariffs, more free trade, but also to protect ourselves against uh, protectionism. So potential rise in barriers to trade or, or tariffs around the world. And in terms of our prioritization, we're starting with four countries who are allies. They're all free market democracies. So the United States, uh, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. And you know, there isn't a specific timetable for any of those agreements. And of course, we won't be prioritizing speed over quality. Having said that, you know, we have a very strong team of negotiators, a large team of negotiators, and we are making rapid progress. So we've just completed uh, round two with the United States. Uh, we've just kicked off negotiations with Australia. We're already uh, in negotiations with Japan. And the aim of that is first of all, to bring benefits to British business. If you look at the US deal, for example, that's likely to benefit particularly uh, parts of the UK outside London. So the Midlands, Scotland, the North of England by reducing tariffs on industrial goods. Uh, we expect to remove half a billion pounds uh, worth of tariffs through that deal. It's also beneficial to the UK's farmers in terms of giving them more access to the US market. But also, we want to strike an advanced digital and data chapter. And this is an area where the UK is strong. Uh, we're third in the world for our number of billion dollar tech companies after the US and China. Advantages for us in having our own independent trade policies, we are able to be more ambitious in terms of those digital and data agreements. And that applies to the United States, Japan, and also Australia and New Zealand, uh, both countries which lead the way uh, in those areas. And the longer term ambition, as you mentioned, is for us to accede to CPTPP. And why do we want to do that? First of all, we want Britain to be linked up to the fast growing Pacific region. Uh, we see a lot of economic opportunities there. Uh, we want to diversify our trade uh, away from solely trading with our traditional partners. We also see CPTPP as a very high standards agreement uh, with very ambitious provisions uh, in areas like services, digital and data. And also uh, we see it as a free trade area, which is a significant size in its own right, uh, together with having an arrangement with the United States that would cover uh, a significant amount of the UK's trade, alongside as well getting a good deal uh, with the European Union. I should point out at this point, I'm not responsible for negotiating with the European Union. My job as Trade Secretary is to negotiate uh, those trade agreements uh, with the rest of the world. But, you know, 
the UK, I think, has historically been a free trading nation. I think we've got a big opportunity there to once again uh, become a liberal free trading nation who stands for free and fair trade, but also the rules-based global system. And I see by striking uh, these advanced trade agreements that have a strong rules-based framework, not only are they good in themselves, CPTPP is, but it also prevents, prevents a challenge to some of the impasse that is taking place in the global trading system. So we want to see reform uh, at the World Trade Organization. In fact, today, the United Kingdom has nominated uh, Dr. Liam Fox as our candidate uh, in that WTO race for Director General. And we see signing up to advanced plurilateral agreements and advanced bilateral agreements as a good way of putting pressure on that global multilateral system to change, particularly in areas where there's been a hiatus, uh, whether that's digital services, uh, environmental goods as well. So we want to see a free and fair global trading system where countries follow the rules. Our strategy is to work with like-minded countries to build that coalition, both for the benefit of British businesses and consumers, but also to the broader benefit of the global trading system. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction uh, to, to the very ambitious uh, uh, negotiations uh, program that, uh, that you lead. Uh, let me now turn it over uh, to Adam uh, and, and ask you, Adam, what role do you see for the UK in the global trading system? Uh, and whether you think uh, the negotiation of all of the agreements, if uh, successful, uh, could land the UK a special place in the trading system? And how could the UK build, in your opinion, on this, uh, on this uh, to strengthen global trade cooperation? Thank you, first of all, Annabelle, for showing such leadership and skill in running trade wins. I'm not only nominally your boss, I'm a fan. So I'm grateful to you for doing, having me. And thanks especially to the Right Honorable Secretary of State for joining us to set out her ambitious agenda. I just want to say from the start, the prioritization she puts on potential accession to CPTPP and the reason behind it, uh, that it is a high standards agreement, I think are the right motivations for her to prioritize for the UK and for the world. So I want to commend that. I would like to step back a moment, though, before I respond about the UK's role and talk about the world into which the UK enters as a trading nation, uh, disassociating itself from the EU trade policy. We're in a world where many forces, not just the Trump administration, but obviously abetted by the Trump administration and accelerated by the Trump administration, where globalization is corroding. And I choose the word corroding because it's very uneven. It, the nature of what the withdrawal of the US from trade leadership and economic leadership is that it makes the playing field different in different regions, different in different sectors, different in different areas of economics, be it trade, investment, environmental regulation, culture, and so on. And so while it is not the case that trade is going away, uh, if anything, we've seen many deals struck by the EU, by Japan, by Australia, and we hope in future by the UK. It is a world in which individual countries that are not, frankly, China, US, or the EU, even large ones like the UK, relatively speaking, are going to have to navigate very difficult water. Now, this is, and not ascribing any of this to Secretary Trust, this is resonant with certain self-images in British foreign policy and British public policy of Britain being in the balance, Britain punching above its weight, Britain having to be diplomatic and having certain allies like the US and Australia, but always balancing, Britain showing leadership. Some of this is valid and some of this is post-imperial fantasy. But the fact remains that Britain, like Singapore, like Australia, like Canada, like Israel, like a host of other countries in this world, is going to have to be diplomatically nimble and the, in its economic relations. And the state secretary in her opening remarks very carefully did not say anything right about China one way or the other, which I think was wise and diplomatic in that sense. 
for her to do so, although I'm sure when we ask her, she will have her views. But the, the important thing is that the UK is going to have to definitely manage between the issues of how much does it align with the US, how much does it let the US or Japan, or for that matter, even Australia, drive a hard bargain on their own terms because the UK, despite being a large economy and despite being a trading economy, is fundamentally small. Is the UK prepared to become a very active member of CPTPC, which gives the kind of weight and heft to the rules and standards that are being set there that the EU has for setting its standards because of its large market? Is the UK prepared to side with the EU in a partnership kind of way, not the deep detailed partnership that Secretary Truss's cabinet colleague is negotiating specifically with the EU, but in the sense that, especially if Trump is reelected, that the US may not be providing constructive leadership and it will frankly be up to the EU and those, including I hope the UK who associate with it, to draw the line of a middle path of between overt conflict with China and Chinese exploitation. And these are all very difficult things that are going to have to be managed on a case-by-case -case basis. The final thing I would say, uh, and again, going back to my initial point of praising Secretary Truss and the government for prioritizing CPTPP and the Japan deal, is that it is a high standards deal. The greatest fear I had about Brexit, beyond its obvious uh, nationalist overtones that I found offensive, was in economic tones that the UK might be tempted to engage in a race to the bottom of the standard. It is reasonable to, for the UK to argue, we may not want to be as close on standards as the EU demands, but we still wish to be at the forefront of high standards agreements, including in services and tech. And I think the deals with the potential deal with Japan as an entree into the deal with CPP, CPTPP would be a way for the UK to achieve that kind of high standard deal that the secretary mentioned. Annabelle. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Adam, uh, for putting uh, all this trade negotiations uh, program in uh, in the context of this uh, of the challenging world in which uh, we are currently living, certainly on the trade front. Um, let me now start with a few questions uh, before I go to, uh, to our audience. Um, and uh, we, we know, and uh, Secretary Truss, um, we, we know that um, uh, the negotiations of the UK with the EU are not part of your uh, portfolio. Uh, we know that uh, this negotiation will define the kind of partnership that the uh, UK will have with the EU when the transition period ends by, uh, by December this year. And uh, we also know that the alternatives that are in play right now are basically two, uh, a deal that would be similar to the Canada-EU trade agreement or no deal in which uh, the WTO rules would apply. Now, having said this, uh, it is also the case that uh, the outcome of the UK-EU uh, trade discussions uh, will impact uh, other trade negotiations. So I'd like to ask you, Secretary, uh, what is what is your view on uh, on the impact of this uh, UK EU uh, negotiations on on this other uh, agreements that you are currently negotiating? And in particular, I would like to pick on one of the points that Adam um, was referring to, which is the issue of uh, standards, uh, because this is a topic that I think is very um, closely is being closely watched by the UK uh, partners. Uh, the US, on the one hand, for example, would probably like to uh, uh, to demand the reduction of UK regulatory barriers. Uh, while the UK may need to maintain a degree of alignment with the EU, maybe in order to secure continued access to the EU market. So how do you manage uh, all these uh, tensions uh, in the negotiations? Well, thank you. Thank you, Annabelle. I would make the point that we've been very clear in our negotiations with the EU that we want to have our own independent regulatory standards as the UK, and we're not looking for alignment with the EU. So that leads us to a Canada-style deal. And if you look at countries like Canada or Japan, you know, they are capable of being parts of other agreements, whether that's CPTPP or, in the case of Canada, USMCA, whilst also having a good trade deal 
with the EU. So that is essentially our negotiating model. Uh, those are two countries we're looking at for precedence uh, in terms of the details of our negotiation with the EU, but also when we are seeking to negotiate with other partners around the world. So I think it's perfectly compatible for the UK to have its own high uh, regulatory standards for us to have a good trade deal with the EU, but also to be part of CPTPP and also to be part of a trade deal with the United States. But I think it's important to note that one of the motivations for leaving with the EU was the issue of regulatory sovereignty. So the EU is not a trade area like CPTPP. It's obviously a lot deeper uh, with regulatory harmonization. And that is not what the UK is looking for. Uh, we are looking for a deal that allows the UK to set its own uh, regulatory standards. And in the same way, uh, we won't be told what our regulatory standards are by the EU. Uh, that is also the case for the US or indeed any other trading partners we're working with. And certainly thus far in our negotiations with the US and also with other trading partners, I think that's very compatible with the types of deal we're seeking to negotiate. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Adam, what is, what is your views on this? What do you think could be the impact of the uh, EU-UK negotiations and other trade negotiations? Uh, Annabelle, you and uh, Right Honorable Secretary know more about these interactions than I do. I think that the more important, um, the more important issues are frankly from the EU-UK deal, how much the UK decides they wish to engage in protectionism themselves of their fisheries, of their auto industry, of their financial services, and how much that desire to maintain that vis-a-vis -vis Europe interferes with their ability to negotiate these other deals. Secondly, I think it matters a great deal how high standard the US-UK agreement is. I mean, e the EU transition is essentially done and dusted, as the British would say. I realize the minister's colleague is busy negotiating, but we're negotiating, unless there's some kind of terrible political blow up, we're negotiating over very small things, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, in economic terms, it's going to be very close to a no deal uh, WTO rules, whatever is on the table. And that's bad, frankly. For economically, but what's done is done. So the issue to me is much more about how much the attitudes that were some of the negative as opposed to positive attitudes for Brexit, where regulatory sovereignty is one thing, deregulation is another, uh, where fair trade is something that usually is a stalking horse in both the UK and the US for attempts at mercantilism. But I know the Secretary Truss and others in the Boris Johnson administration have made statements about wanting to be liberal free trading brand. It is, to me, those are the attitudes that matter. I think the rest of the world has frankly moved on from EU, UK Brexit, and frankly, largely so is the EU. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Adam. Uh, I think this uh, topic of standards uh, really need, and whether I think you, you put it right, whether it's regular sovereignty or is it deregulation or where is the balance, uh, I guess, uh, in, uh, in, in going forward. And uh, we'll probably be present in the context of, uh, of the different negotiations, um, including uh, uh, the one with the U.S. And um, let, me, let me say a word uh, on, uh, on this negotiation and hear from you. Uh, we know that UK, US, uh, Secretary of Trust, you said you just concluded the second round of uh, negotiations. Uh, while they are at an early stage, uh, differences over market access issues have begun to emerge, as I think it's normal in this kind of uh, negotiations. Um, but more importantly, these negotiations are also taking place against the backdrop of, uh, of broader areas of uh, confrontation. Uh, for instance, uh, the recent launch of the Section 301 investigation uh, against the UK and other members on the part of the US for the adoption of a digital services uh, tax uh, focused on uh, US uh, tech uh, groups. Um, I think the Huawei issue seems to be sort of, you know, being sorted out, but in any case, what do you think would be the impact of these uh, issues of contention 
on the UK uh, and US FTA negotiations. Your mute, sector. Um, in terms of how we set our own taxation policy in the UK, that is a matter for the UK Treasury and it is not part of our trade negotiations. And you know, there are issues. I could also mention the Airbus Boeing dispute, uh, where we are concerned that that issue has dragged on for so long to the mutual detriment of uh, the Airbus countries as well as uh, the United States. And I have urged for urgent resolution of those and urgent negotiation to settle those matters because the beneficiaries are simply other competitors around the world to the detriment of both Europe and the United States. There are a number of issues that we need to be cleared uh, in advance of getting to a resolution with the United States. Uh, other things are the continued ban uh, on UK land into the US market. Having said that, negotiations have so far been positive and constructive, and I do see a way forward uh, for those negotiations. And it, I think it's perfectly possible, and this has been shown in numerous deals that the US has struck uh, with other countries, to protect our red lines, to maintain our regulatory independence, whilst at the same time lowering barriers in both directions to the benefit of both of our both of our nations. And just to come back on Zach's point about industry. You know, and... uh, it's Adam, not Zach, by the way. Sorry? It, it's Adam, I, not I Zach. Apologize. I do apologize. I'm very sorry, Adam. Um, to come back on that, um, that point about industry, yes, we are a free trading nation. We do believe in liberalization. If you look at the UK global tariff, it is simpler and lower than the common external tariff that the EU have set, precisely for that reason. But we need to do that in a way that is gradual uh, to support our industry being able to transition uh, to the new world they're going to be operating in. And we need to do it in such a way that it maintains the confidence of businesses and consumers in the UK. And on the subject of fishing and fishing in the EU negotiations, to me, that is a territorial issue as well as a trade issue. So it's not a pure issue about protectionism or tariffs or non-tariff barriers. It's a debate about territorial borders. I don't they think those two, two different things should be conflated in that way. Mm. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is, uh, of course, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. I, I, I have the impression that they will haunt the, the negotiation for, for a while, uh, in any case. Um, Adam, how do you see the US-UK uh, negotiations? I think that there has been an interest expressed um, on, uh, on the UK side uh, to have them uh, conclude uh, this year, uh, although the secretary has been very clear that there's no specific timelines because substance drives uh, negotiations. Uh, but how do you see the, the prospects for this uh, for this negotiations in the U.S., uh, Adam? I unfortunately, or maybe not so unfortunately, see the prospects very limited. Uh, essentially, the smaller and the less quality a deal, the more likely it can get done as both the secretary and you, Annabelle, know that's a general rule um, that you can do things faster if you do things more limited. But the particularly true in this case, uh, the UK US has all the negotiating leverage, frankly. Uh, the US at present doesn't have uh, difficulty in the UK market, and the UK market is not a very big market. For the US. And so there is not really much incentive particularly for Secretary Lighthizer, or excuse me, Ambassador Lighthizer, in the context of US's bilateral bullying approach to deals to do much. Um, there's also, of course, the issue if the Secretary wishes to raise sovereignty matters along with trade of the Northern Irish border, where given the large population of Irish Americans and the number of members of Congress and the Senate who are very deeply concerned about the Good Friday Agreement, that treatment is actually something that the U.S., frankly, would prioritize over anything to do with uh, direct free trade. So then let's imagine if 
President Trump is reelected, I think then this would be at the front of the queue in the new administration or the second term. But again, it would be low quality or extracting things from the UK. If President Biden or now Vice President Biden were to be elected, I think the UK then does go to the back of the queue. Okay, so we'll, uh, this is uh, still at the early stages of play, and I guess we will, uh, we will hear more about this. I think a new round of trade negotiations is coming uh, now in, in July. Um, so we'll see how, how things uh, go, and I think we'll be, playing, uh, we'll be paying a lot of attention. I want to move now um, to, I, I have a few questions of my own, but we're getting a, a lot of questions from our audience. Uh, so I want to pick up uh, a couple of them uh, and bring it to, um, to the attention of both of you. So the first one, we have a couple of people from uh, Turkey uh, asking, uh, we have uh, Said Akman, and then we also have here uh, Subide Togan, asking, you know, how high standard trade agreements does the UK aim in its trade negotiations with other countries like Turkey? And then Said also asking, how will this negotiation play out in light of the customs union that uh, Turkey has with the um, EU? So, uh, so a lot of interest on Turkey. Secretary, what, what do you have to say about this? Uh, we are in active discussions with the Turkish government. In fact, we're due to have a meeting uh, next week. First of all, to make sure that we are able to continue uh, with our current trading arrangements, including uh, making sure those are aligned with our discussions with the EU. Uh, but we are interested you know, in the longer term at looking at what more we can do. But the discussions so far have been very positive. Hmm. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we have another question on the topic that I think is, is of course very relevant and in particular because the uh, UK will be hosting uh, the next uh, climate uh, meeting. But we have a couple of questions here from uh, Tom Wills asking, how would the UK's future trade policy support the fight against uh, climate chaos? Uh, and how will the UK ensure that future FTA support uh, sustainable international development? So the relationship between trade and climate change, uh, Secretary. Well, first of all, we're, we're absolutely clear in any of the negotiations we're conducting, they should not have a negative impact on the UK's domestic climate change objectives, which is reaching net zero by 2050. And what we are looking for is additional items in those trade negotiations that will improve the environment, whether that's on areas like marine plastic, whether it's on our areas like low carbon goods. And we look to countries like New Zealand, I mean, we think there's a very strong opportunity in our negotiations with New Zealand to achieve a deal which really is exemplary uh, in the environmental sphere. It's also something we are keen to promote at the World Trade Organization. And we were, Want to become an active part of the relevant JSI. It's something that Liam Fox will be putting forward on his platform uh, to be De Director General of the World Trade Organization. But we think the World Trade Organization needs to uh, be much more forward-leaning uh, in terms of environment and environmental goods. Now, of course, that's alongside our negotiations being led by Alok Sharma, ahead of COP26, which is now next year but we see those two things working in tandem and fundamentally we need a global trading system that reflects you know, the way we live now and our beliefs now and that does include areas like environmental goods it does include digital and services those are really important priorities all right thank you thank you very much uh, i know adam that you've been uh, working on this uh, on this topic uh, so maybe you'd like to come in as well you're, you're muted, Adam. Thank you, Annabelle. Um, I am uh, grateful for the Secretary's comments on climate change and to hear that the UK's candidate for WTO, which I don't expect to get very far, but anyway, that at least the platform will include climate change issues. So that is, that is climate change commitment. That's great. I think there is going to have to be a reckoning. And as you mentioned, Annabelle, John Pisani Ferry, Chad Baum, and others at Peterson and us are working on 
how one manages a situation where one block of countries, say the EU plus the UK and New Zealand, move forward faster, say with carbon taxes and regulations than China or the US, which unfortunately I think is likely to be the case. And can you have the right kinds of border adjustment taxes to make it a fair deal? Uh, and actually it's not just one can say, oh, we, need, we have to be allowed to pursue our domestic vision of, of climate change. It will matter if you are having things produced in countries that are dirtier, frankly. Um, now, poorer countries, that's one thing, but your rich competitors is another. So it's non-trivial. This is going to be an ongoing issue, um, and working it out is going to be quite hard, but it has to be done. I, I just want to pick up, though, you had mentioned, and I saw in the Q&A, the issue of DFID, the Department of Foreign Aid, of foreign um, development in the UK being merged back into the FCO, the Foreign Commonwealth Office, and the joining of these things. And, and while I, I think it's important to remember the UK, and in particular DFID, has been an incredible leader on intellectually and in principles in a lot of ways on development for the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, this is one of the instances where it's not perfect. The UK is not giving away as much money as a percentage of GDP as Norway, say. But it is, they have shown real leadership and some of the hype over the UK special role matters. And so I worry about the reintegration of if it is a sign of subordinating development goals to foreign policy. And this is not particularly a UK thing. The US, China, France, the former Soviet Union, <laughs> or the Soviet Union and then Russia, all kinds of places have uh, subordinated development aid to foreign policy goals and it's generally gone badly for both foreign policy and development. So whatever reorg the Her Majesty's government pursues, I am hoping that both as part of the trade agenda and overall, the development agenda is actually insulated in the UK where it's been actually, to in my view, a quite large success and a contributor to some positive things over the last term. Thank you, thank you, uh, Adam. Uh, Secretary, would you want to say something about the UK and particularly the, also the connection between trade and development? Uh, because as Adam says, I think the, US, the UK is widely recognized uh, as, a, as a leader in the field. So I, I completely refute the idea that somehow our development policy has been subordinated uh, to foreign policy. It's more that we want the two policies to work much better in tandem. Uh, which makes sense. And the UK is one of the few countries that is committed in legislation to 0.7% of GDP uh, being spent on aid. And I think we have a very, very uh, proud record uh, in this area. And I think it's a strengthening uh, that we're bringing together those two departments to make sure uh, we have a fully, a fully coordinated policy. So I don't, I refute the idea that it's a backward step and many other uh, leading nations do exactly the same thing and run those two uh, policy areas together. And of course, in terms of the trade agenda, I work very closely with the Foreign Office, making sure that we are helping initiatives like Chi Trades, for example, helping developing countries trade out of poverty. And is one of our priorities that we've set in areas like our UK global tariff is particularly helping the least developed countries with uh, more access to our markets to help those nations trade out of poverty. And it's something that we will be championing at the World Trade Organization. Uh, Secretary Trust, uh, quickly, just first, you're not refuting, you're disputing. Um, and the so if you want to refute, let's go into the specifics. If you and the portfolio of trade make a general statement about preferences and access for developing countries, that's great. I support that. Um, but then what role does foreign policy have to play? If you make it conditional on your relations with individual countries, as seems to be the case, if you link it to foreign policy, then you're actually doing this good. Well, I, I dispute and refute that point. I mean, I've, I've made it very clear that we continue with our commitment on 0.7% of GDP, leading commitment uh, across the world. And we are going to have a better coordinated policy. I think that's a good thing. 
So I want to move uh, to, thank you very much to both of you. I want to move to uh, the WTO because there's a lot of questions around that. But before I do that, I just want to ask uh, Secretary, uh, there's a question in the audience from uh, Martin Pinheiro on will the Commonwealth play a role now after Brexit? Uh, so I wanted to uh, bring this uh, topic to you, Secretary. Uh, certainly. Yes, in that, of course, the Commonwealth is very important to the UK and you know, they are key. Uh, we work closely with Commonwealth countries. So, for example, at the World Trade Organization, the Commonwealth countries represent 33% of the membership of the World Trade Organization. And it's very important, I think, that we don't allow the major players to step over and subvert the opportunities of smaller countries in trade. And that's one of our great reasons for, for supporting a rules-based system, is rules benefit those smaller countries who don't have the might uh, necessary to fight in a deal-by-deal -deal world. So we have a strong alliance of Commonwealth countries at the World Trade Organization saying precisely that. And in fact, I hosted a meeting last year of Commonwealth Trade, Commonwealth trade Ministers them in precisely that. Now, of course, in the Commonwealth, there are, it's a very diverse group of nations, and we will work with different Commonwealth countries in different ways uh, to promote trade and development. But as I say, overall, the thing that we are very united on is a great belief in the rules based system. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so let me now turn uh, to uh, the WTO. And uh, I think there are like two sets of questions here, and then maybe one specific one. The first set of questions relates to uh, the, uh, the UK nomination of Dr. Liam Fox for the uh, position of Director General. You referred to it, uh, Secretary, and I think this has been presented uh, today. Uh, so we have a couple of questions here from uh, Maria Sokolova and from Deborah Elms, uh, basically asking, uh, what does uh, Mr. Fox uh, bring to the WTO that other countries do not? So why would he be a good candidate for a WTO director general? And after that, I would like to talk a little bit about what kind of reforms are needed uh, to make the WTO fit for a purpose. Um, so let me start with you, Secretary, uh, and hear your views about um, why Dr. Fox for the WTO. Well, first of all, Dr. Fox is a great believer in free and fair trade and the uh, rules-based multilateral system, and I think that's very important. Uh, we have a champion of that at this time. Secondly, he is a great believer in the power of trade for development, and he's been a passionate supporter of that. As my predecessor as Trade Secretary, he promoted that agenda globally. And thirdly, he's somebody who can get things done. Uh, I think what we need, and I've said this before in various public fora about the WTO, is we need somebody who's a big hitter, who's got the political clout to make things happen at the WTO, because the fact is not enough has happened and various projects have been left in abeyance. So it's his ability to get things done as well, I think is extremely important. Okay, so so we will we will hear more from him, I guess, in the next uh, few days as uh, the candidates uh, in the WTO uh, begin to present their views around the future of the organization. So, on this particular point, uh, Secretary, what are your views on uh, on the reforms that are needed in the WTO uh, to make it fit for purpose? Then I'd like to hear from you, Adam, uh, in terms of what you think the UK could bring to the WTO. Uh, in, uh, in reforming the organization. So, Secretary, let me ask you first, please. Very good. So, I mean, the WTO rulebook was established in 1995, and the world has moved on since then, particularly in areas like digital trade, uh, the environment. And I think an updating of the WTO rules and the way the WTO operates is very important. I also think we need to make significantly more progress on areas like transparency, uh, for example. It's very important that a system has credibility and that all its members are being seen to follow the rules. And essentially, the UK has a twin track strategy. Yes, we want to see reform at the WTO, but we are also going to pursue membership of plurilateral agreements 
where countries agree on high standards, rules-based uh, operation to challenge uh, the WTO. We, we can't hear you, Secretary. Uh, sorry, was I on mute all that time? Not all the time, just about halfway. Okay. Um, well, I was saying about how we need to update the rule book uh, to reflect you know, digital trade, to reflect uh, environmental concerns. Uh, but I think we also uh, need to make sure that we have fully transparent operation at the WTO as well, uh, and ensuring that all countries are following the rules and it's fair. And those are big challenges that need to be dealt with. And my latter point was that the UK has a twin track approach, first multilaterally uh, with partners on high standards agreements like CPTPP to put pressure on the WTO to reform, as well as, of course, directly working with other members of the WTO. And you, you asked me a question about how does the UK see its role? We see our role as working with like-minded nations, obviously key allies are countries like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Japan, you know, working with the EU, uh, United States, others to, you know, and there will be issues where we agree and don't agree uh, with some of those partners, but we see ourselves as a country that believes in the system, that believes in free trade, that believes in a rules-based system, and we will work with like-minded partners to promote that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Adam? Yes, thank you. Um, again, I appreciate the Secretary's commitment to high standards and digitalization, and I appreciate in a different sense the Secretary very carefully, again, never mentioning the word China, um, because, of course, that when we talk about whether or not countries are following the rules, whether or not China is following the rules on state aid, on subsidies, on intellectual property rights, and so on, is going to be the critical, one of the critical, excuse me fault lines in the WTO. I don't believe that everything China is accused of is either true or even if true is as damaging as say some people would make it. But I also know, and I respect the secretary's need to be careful, but I think for purpose of discussion, we have to recognize that that's the great divide in many ways. Um, and so therefore I think that it would be great if the UK could be joining up very explicitly with the already agreed approach on taking on subsidies that the EU, Japan, and the US had, um, yeah. which is directed at China and directed more broadly, and which was partly reflected in the CPTPP negotiations, um, but was developed much more since then. It hasn't moved forward in part because the Trump administration hasn't put a priority on it, even though on paper and in principle they've agreed to it. It would be great to see the UK explicitly take that. A second point is that the one of the big failures, if we want to talk about reform of the WTO, is the issue of having everything done by essentially absolute, not just absolute majority, but by consensus. Well before Trump, in the Bush and the Obama administration, US trading officials, again, largely justified, but probably excessively, we're venting frustration about the WTO and the latest trade round and the inability to get anything past Brazil and India and so on. And so when we talk about such forms, I think the issue has to be thinking through that voting rule. Can you get a truly multilateral system to work? But then of course it has to be then not reverting back to the rich boys club and particularly the rich white club. If we say US, Australia, Canada, UK, uh, de facto Northern Europe, um, us Japan, which is sort of honorary, that uh, doesn't send a great message to the rest of the world. So this is a non-trivial problem. We have to figure out a way of getting past the, the multilateral deadlock at the WTO, but not making it just revert back to the Bretton Woods Committee of 1995. Third point on WTO, in my view, and of course I'm drawing on work by you, Annabelle, and other Peterson colleagues, it, that I think the EU, frankly, has shown real leadership in putting together the alternative dispute settlement mechanism that has been put in place voluntarily among like-minded countries. I think the dispute settlement mechanism has actually been a success of the WTO since 95, and it would be great to see the UK 
publicly join up with that effort. If I can make a final point, Annabelle knows I try never to comment on individual candidates for individual jobs. So I offer no comment, positive or negative, on Dr. Fox. Um, what I would say is I think the UK could make a real contribution by just being a member of the WTO now that it's emerged from the EU rather than immediately asserting that it should be have its candidate for a leader. And I think the, w the UK could do by well by assign going instead for a deputy director general. Now, maybe that's the intent of this because of course, by definition, the UK is not a political heavyweight in the WTO uh, compared to some others. But it, it's to me, it, it will rankle people that the UK, as soon as they suddenly start doing trade policy again, they suddenly think they should have a candidate for director general. You know, it'd be nice just as the US is, I hope opting out of this, it'd be nice to let someone else have a chance. Thank you, uh, Adam, for your comments. Uh, Secretary, uh, you may want to pick on, on a couple of this. I but I think, I yeah, please, please go ahead. Yeah. I've never had a, uh, a WTA director general, of course, so I would, I would point that out. I would agree with um, Adam on the point about subsidies, mm -hmm. and I do support the work that the US, the EU, and Japan has done on precisely uh, that subject of the WTO, I think that's right. And I am, I am happy to talk about China. Uh, we have a clear-eyed policy towards China. Of course, China is a very large trading partner of the United Kingdom. However, there are some practices which we think need to stop. And we do support the rules-based system. And I'm by no means saying that China is, not, is the only country that doesn't follow the rules. There are other examples as well. But in order for the multilateral system to work, everybody has to follow the rules. And that's particularly of the benefit of some of the small uh, developing countries that we were discussing earlier in the call. The point I make, though, about some of the suggestions about changing the consensus system is I would be very worried about the situation we ended up in when we were a member of the EU of, uh, of overreach, essentially. And I think we have to be careful uh, that the WTO doesn't overreach its role as well. So I support a proper multilateral rules-based system, but we shouldn't ask uh, for a system that becomes a, you know, that essentially diminishes the nation's sovereignty that are members of it. And I think that's always a danger. Uh, there's always a danger of overreach in these situations. Another point I make about the WTO is I think one of the ways of getting things done can be plurilateral agreements within the WTO. So there's been some positive moves, for example, on uh, JSIs in areas like digital, and the UK very much wants to be uh, play an active role in that. In fact, we have played an active role in that uh, under our ambassador, Julian Braithwaite. Yeah, thank you very much. I think your ambassador is doing a, a great job in the WTO. Two quick questions, uh, uh, Secretary. One is, uh, I, Adam mentioned this, and we have a question from Simon Lester. Will the UK join the multi-party interim appeal arbitration arrangement where other 22 members are participating? And a second quick question, because this is of great interest to me, what is the UK's position on special and differential treatment in the WTO? Well, on, the, on both of those subjects, and we, as uh, Adam pointed out, we are currently taking up our independent seat at the WTO, and we are working uh, on, on the details of those particular issues, but we're not ready yet to come forward with a position. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think with this, we are close to uh, the hour. So I would like to thank very much uh, Secretary Truss uh, for being with us here at Tradewinds and Adam Posen for being with us and for your continued support uh, to Tradewinds as well. Uh, I think it's been a great conversation. Uh, and I think we need, uh, we probably will need to bring you back, Secretary, because we have a lot of things uh, to, to, talk, uh, to talk with you. Uh, so very good. Well, I'd love to do that. I might get some you. better ID sorted as well. I'm afraid I've had a few issues through this call. So. Uh, uh, Next no. time I'll sort my IT out. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very thank much, you. Secretary. Thank you very much. Um, I also would like to thank our audience uh, and thank you for posting uh, all of your questions. Uh, please visit us on uh, Twitter and please keep uh, coming back and bringing your colleagues and friends uh, with you. 
I also want to thank uh, Steve Weissman and all of his uh, team uh, uh, and my colleagues at PIE who uh, helped make uh, treatments possible. And finally, I also would like to invite you to the next episode of TradeWinds on Wednesday, July 15. We will explore a topic that we have discussed a bit today, which is uh, China in the WTO, uh, current issues and prospects for reform uh, with Ambassador uh, Yang uh, Chanchek, uh, China's ambassador and permanent representative to the WTO, and with our own uh, senior fellow, uh, Chad Pang. So until next Wednesday, and uh, thank you very much for joining.